think he's with us again. Morning, sunshine. Good to see you again. Sleep well? Where's my son, you fat bastard? All in good time. If you don't tell me where my son is, you better kill me now! Stop talking and start listening, Hammond. You're in no position to making demands. Because we're going to play a little game. Eyebrows, give me the phone. I ring you, you do the job. I do what I tell you, the kid dies. I did where I tell you, the kid dies. I did when I tell you, the kid dies. You get in my drift? You want to see your kid alive? You do exactly what I say. You let me down, you talk to anyone, or you're late. Your kid dies! Gosh. You're on the run! You killed your wife! You left the murder weapon behind at the scene! <laughs> you're a convicted bank robber! What do you think your chances are? I know where your kid is. I can even get to him. I know the layout and the security. All of it. Get up. You're not paying attention. Do you think the filth are going to believe you? <laughs> Being American, I'm not really cultured when it comes to British media. All I know about you Brits is what I learned in history class and whatever was on TV in the 90s like Mr. Bean, Thomas the Tank Engine, and Rupert. Ah oh man, remember Rupert? Such a good show. Oh yeah, and the obvious one, Harry Potter. Nowadays, everything I learn about the British is against my will. Like all that Brexit stuff or whatever the royal family are up to. Though most of my favorite YouTube essayists are British. And The Inbetweeners is probably one of my favorite shows of all time. Oh friend, football friend. Oh. Best friends forever and ever. Oh, friend! Fuck off, all right? He's not my friend. But there was something that left an impression on me about the British. A video game. No, not Assassin's Creed 3. Though I do like that game a lot. It was a forgotten gem of the PS2 era. The Getaway. Like true crime streets of LA, I didn't really remember much about the game before I decided to replay it for the channel. I remember it was kind of like Grand Theft Auto. It was British and that it was more difficult than GTA 3. Man, if that isn't the understatement of the year, but I'll get into the difficulty later. The game is set in the criminal underworld of London and is inspired by the British gang movies of Guy Ritchie, which I've never seen, but he's had a long film career, so I'm assuming they're good. To quote the game's manual, it's 8 a.m. in Covent Garden. A woman is shot dead in the street. In the distance, a child screams as a car disappears with a screech of tires. It's a crime that will spark a series of shocking events involving London's most notorious gangs. You'll play as the fugitive, Mark Hammond, a former member of the Soho-based Collins gang. He's now on the run for the suspected murder of his wife Susie, but also desperate to be reunited with his kidnapped son Alex. Unfortunately, he's drawn back into the criminal life by the man holding his son hostage, Charlie Jolson the aging leader of the Bethnal Green mob. Charlie dangles Alex's safety and well-being over Mark's head, forcing him to commit crimes and attack his gang rivals. You'll also play as the vigilante, Frank Carter, a police officer and member of the elite flying squad. He's obsessed with taking down Charlie Jolson and the Bethnal Green mob, but his superiors are apathetic to Charlie's actions, and some are even in bed with him so Frank will have to break the rules and do whatever it takes in order to bring the gang down. While separated by opposite sides of the law, both men are desperate for revenge, and circumstances in the story will bring the two men together and unite them against their mutual enemy. It's a good setup for a game, and it's pretty cool you have two main characters to play as, though you can only play as Frank after completing Mark's half of the story. On a surface level, you might think it's yet another open sandbox crime game trying to ride the coattails of GTA 3, but that's not really the case. For one, this game was actually in development before GTA 3, and was supposed to be a launch title for the PS2, but ended up getting delayed till 2002. For another, once you start to play it and explore its world, you see it doesn't really take much influence from the Grand Theft Auto formula. 
The Getaway is a bit of an oddity from this time period, as it's closer to your standard action-adventure game, sharing more similarities with driving games like Driver, than it does GTA 3. For one, the missions follow a linear order, the next one starting immediately after the last one ends, usually only a cutscene separating them. So there isn't some quest giver you travel to and speak to on the map. Also, it's not set in a fictional city based off of London, it's the real deal painstakingly recreated in-game to capture its look circa 2002, not only featuring some of its most famous landmarks, but also the same streets and roads, along with several storefronts and restaurants, with a lot of real-world brands like Burger King and FedEx actually showing up in the game. Though this version of London shares more similarities with True Crime's version of LA than it does with Liberty City, as outside of missions or just driving around, there isn't actually anything you can do in this city there aren't any weapon shops or collectibles hidden around the map to discover. Technically, you can't even free roam and explore London during the main story, as some missions are timed and you're not given the luxury to goof around to take in the sights. It's only after you beat Mark's campaign that you'll unlock free roam. But again, really, you're just driving around. So outside of killing pedestrians or the cops, there isn't anything to do outside of sightseeing or trying to find those real London landmarks which is considerably harder to do than you would expect, as there is no in-game map at all. Yeah, like GTA 3, back in the day you had to make do with a physical map that came inside the game box. But even with the map, it can still be tough to get around, as there's no mini-map on your HUD showing your current location or marking off where you need to go. In fact, there's no HUD at all. No health bar, no ammo count, no arrow pointing you where to go or even what your current objective is. According to the developers, this was to make the game more cinematic, to add some realism to the experience and let the player feel like they're in an interactive movie. So how the hell are you supposed to figure out where to go, what to do in a mission, or even how much health you have? Well, they came up with some inventive ways to these problems that wouldn't break the immersion they wanted to create. Returning to driving, and this was something I've always remembered about the getaway, is that you would use your blinkers to figure out what direction to go. Once you're given a place to drive to for a mission, one of the blinkers will light up to indicate which direction to take, both blinking together once you've arrived at your destination. It's a clever way to guide the player, and intuitive enough that you can figure it out pretty fast, even if you didn't read the game's manual. I'd say my only issue with it is that the directions don't take one-way streets into account, so a lot of the times you'll end up driving on the wrong side of the road to get where you're going. Also, if your car takes enough damage from behind, your turn signals will get damaged and you won't know which way to go so you'll have to steal a fresh car. When it comes to driving in the getaway, it's a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, the cars handle relatively well and have a satisfying weight to them, which is a welcome change from the flimsy cars of GTA 3 that would topple over at the slightest turn. Another positive is their durability, as cars can withstand a fair amount of scrapes and collisions without exploding. Though high-speed head-on collisions can cause the car to emit black smoke and slow down till it gives out which adds a touch of realism. They still can catch on fire, but you have enough time to get out and don't have to worry about the car exploding after. The cars all use the names of the real-life cars they're modeled on too, like Nissan, Honda, or Jeep. No made-up names like in GTA. I guess my problem isn't the driving mechanics, but just actually driving around London. Do you like sitting in the middle of the road? Do you like moving at two miles an hour all day long? Come to fucking England! Yeah, in recreating the authentic London experience, they also recreated how it feels to drive around there too. Like I mentioned before, my first issue is the one-way streets. A lot of them are cramped and only accommodate one lane of traffic. So if you're in a rush trying to get somewhere, it could be a nightmare to try and squeeze through without damaging your car. Traffic lanes in general tend to be small, so even if you're going the right direction, you might be stuck behind traffic if you can't slip between cars. Some of you are probably scratching your head like, Dude, just ram your way through other cars. It's not like you have to obey traffic laws, right? Wrong. Because there are cops on the road, and if they see you driving the wrong way, running over pedestrians on sidewalks, or just being a menace on the road, they'll chase after you. They are unbelievably annoying to try and get rid of, as they tend to stick to your car like glue and follow you without any issue. And unlike GTA, you can't change your camera angle while driving, so you have no clue how far they are or if you lost them unless you hear their sirens go silent. They'll also constantly smash into your car or try to block your path. So after enough damage, you'll have to bail and steal a new ride. That's when they'll get out of their own car and open fire. 
either killing you if you're not careful, or arresting you if you get too close, causing you to restart from the last checkpoint in your current mission. Caps won't instantly spawn if you break a traffic law, and they won't even bother you when you're playing as Frank later on, but it's still annoying. Since Mark is technically a criminal on the run, he doesn't even have to break the law, as the coppers will go after him as soon as they spot him. On top of that, gang members will also be after you whenever you enter their territory. And unlike the cops, they'll be actively shooting at you from their cars. And you can't return fire either, as there's no drive-by shooting in this game. Oh yeah, and you know how I said some missions are timed? Well, because there's no HUD, you can't actually see the timer and know how much time you have. All you have is a tune that will start playing when you're running out of time. But if you're nowhere near your destination, which due to the lack of a map, you'll have no clue how close you even are, it's almost always a guaranteed fail once you hear that music. Hey, this is one Forcing you to restart the mission and drive all over again. And some of these time missions have really tight windows of success, demanding almost perfect driving with close to no stops or switching cars. So you better be ready to memorize the streets of London. Now, outside of driving, the other thing you'll be doing is shooting, and quite a lot of it. Similar to true crime streets of LA, you'll start with a simple pistol and pick up the weapons belonging to the criminals you kill, even being able to dual wield. You have no aiming reticle in this game, but thankfully it does make use of auto aim, which turns the camera and zooms in a bit on the enemy you're locked onto. It also has manual aim, and yikes, it is not good. The best I can describe it is it's a very archaic version of aiming down iron sights. But since it doesn't go first person or zoom in, it becomes incredibly difficult to aim accurately and hit your targets. Thankfully, you're never really required to use manual aim, at most only if you want to hit some exploding barrels. Accuracy can feel a bit off, at least with the stronger weapons. As for example, an AK-47 tends to miss more shots at a distance than up close, especially in comparison to the pistol. I know nothing about how guns work, but I figure this is probably because of the assault rifle's higher rate of fire. That or the devs didn't want you dropping enemies too easily from the other side of the room. Now your playable characters are pretty durable, able to soak up a decent amount of bullets before they die, with a nice touch of damage reflecting on their bodies. The game uses the character's physical condition to show their current health in the absence of a HUD. When Mark or Frank are covered in blood and limping, their walking animation slows down to indicate they're close to dying. Since the game is going for realism, you can't pick up a heart or a health kit to fix yourself up. Instead, you just lean on a wall. Ah yes, give me a couple seconds to catch my breath and my bullet wounds will be healed. It's a very early version of regenerating health that would become popular in shooters during the 360 and PS3 era of gaming. It's fine, I guess. Though sometimes it can be a chore to position your character the right way so they'll start leaning. And if you're really low on health, it can feel painfully slow to wait for them to recover. Despite being able to heal at any moment, it's not really a get out of jail free card, as there are some levels where the only wall you can lean on is totally exposed to your enemies. So you have to risk peeking over cover to try and kill your enemies before you can find a moment to heal yourself. Oh yeah, there's cover in this game too. Nothing special, just snap onto a wall or a crate and shoot from behind it. You also get a nifty dodge roll you can use to try and avoid getting shot. Alrighty, one last thing to cover before I delve into the story, and that's stealth. Or what the game tries to pass off as stealth. Several missions will have you sneaking through an area or covertly following someone, making use of cover to stay out of sight when possible. Since there are no indicators to help you figure out an enemy's cone of vision or warn you if you're too close to someone, you're going to need a lot of patience for these sections. It sounds simple on paper, but several factors make it much more frustrating than it should be. For one is the camera. Similar to GTA 3, you don't have actual control of it, and it will just flip to the direction Mark or Frank are facing. That means you won't be able to look behind you or use the camera to observe your surroundings and enemy placement. Next, during certain trailing sections, you need to be in just the right spot or wait a certain amount of time before the target moves onto their next designated area. Sometimes this can take forever. Other times it might just end up bugging out as the character will just not move no matter where you are, forcing a restart. You do have stealth kills you can use to take out guards that you can't get past, using either a neck snap, hitting them with the butt of your pistol, or in Frank's case, you can smack handcuffs on them and arrest them. Not sure why that counts as stealth. He doesn't knock them out while arresting them, so what's stopping them from blowing your cover? 
You initiate stealth kills by standing behind an enemy and hitting square, but they can be finicky to pull off, mainly because of how sensitive the running controls are. Due to your character's tendency to sprint upon the slightest push of the analog stick in any direction, it's easy to accidentally run past a guard instead of sneaking up behind them. This will compromise your cover and force you to restart a mission from the last checkpoint. And finally, the lack of any type of in-game map creates another problem during these stealth sections, trying to figure out where to go. You'll be giving your mission objective during its opening cutscene, and you can remind yourself of it using the mission briefing in the pause menu. So you might be told to sneak into someone's office in a given area, but because you don't have a layout of the area, it's essentially trial and error trying to find it. In later sections of the game, where the areas are larger and the rooms and hallways look similar, it can be challenging to navigate and find your way. This confusion can lead to getting lost and turning the wrong way, resulting in being spotted by enemies and forcing a restart. While ultimately I enjoyed the gameplay of the getaway, it can be really frustrating at times, and demands a lot of patience from the player to figure things out on their own. Maybe not so hard nowadays in the digital age, where you can look up a walkthrough with videos, but back in the early 2000s, I wouldn't be surprised if most gamers gave up without beating it. Which is a shame, as the story really makes it worth completing the game. So let's go ahead and dive in. Yeah, what's with a bird, Harry? She's one of Charlie's specials. Specials? Special people with special jobs. She used to be on the game until she found her true calling. What the fuck are you talking about, Harry? She does some wet jobs. Charlie says they never see it coming from a bird. The game begins with four criminals in a car sitting outside Mark Hammond's home. The group confronting his wife Susie as she steps outside with her son Alex. After a bit of back and forth, the group tries to kidnap the both of them, but end up blowing it as one of the would-be kidnappers ends up shooting Susie, alerting Mark who comes rushing outside. Too late to save his wife, he takes off after his son's kidnappers, tracking them down to a warehouse. After he fights his way through the building, he finds Alex and the man responsible for kidnapping him, Charlie Jolson. Where's my son, you fat bastard? Patience, Mark, my boy. All in good time. Morning, you, Charlie. If you don't tell me where my son is, you better kill me now. Is there any way to greet an old friend? Stop talking and start listening, Hammond. You're in no position to be making demands. What's this all about, Charlie? I thought you'd retired. You know I have. I'm not with the Collins' gang anymore. You know that. I'm running a nightclub. I've been out nearly two months and I'm not in the life. I don't do this shit anymore! Relax, son. You'll do yourself an injury. Charlie has some dirty work that needs doing and forcibly recruits Mark to work for him. His past as a bank robber and time in jail means even if he went to the cops, they probably wouldn't believe him about his son's kidnapping or the real circumstances of his wife's death. As it turns out, even though it wasn't their original intention, Mark accidentally incriminated himself in his wife's murder by picking up and leaving behind the gun that shot her when he ran off after his son. Really, really bad move there, Mark. But considering the seriousness of the situation and how he had to chase after the kidnappers, you can slightly forgive him for such a boneheaded move. With his son's life on the line, Mark has no choice but to obey until he can find a way to save Alex, and he can somehow clear his name. That's assuming he survives working for Charlie, though, as the old man forces him to cut ties with his old group, the Collins Gang, which involves driving out to their turf and destroying their restaurant, The Republic, and gunning down any of his old associates that try to stop him. I have zero idea if it's still there, but apparently back in the day, there was a real restaurant located at that exact spot in London. The first job can be tough for new players, as it won't be completely apparent what you have to do, because again, no objective markers. When you arrive at the Republic, you have to ascend the stairs of the restaurant to the higher floors, engaging in a shootout with Mark's former colleagues. You'll have to clear the second and third floor of any Collins gang members, which has Mark accidentally starting a fire during the mayhem. You'll then need to flee the burning building, kill any remaining survivors, and drive away from the crime scene. Charlie, you will, my son. I get to write all this there down there in Soho. All right, Charlie. I've done what you asked. I want my kid back. Don't be hasty, my son. I've got another errand I'd like you to do. 
No way, Jolson. You almost got me killed down there. I hurt people, old friends of mine. And that ain't enough for you, is it? You got some serious fucking nerve. You better look lively, Hammond. I thought you were in a hurry to see your boy. Unfortunately for Mark, he's far from done with doing Charlie's bidding, as the old man wants him to make a hit on the triads next. Mark then rings up his old friend Liam, filling him in on his current situation, as well as what really happened to his wife and son. Liam is hesitant to help Mark, especially since some of the guys he was forced to kill were some of his friends, but he takes the chance, promising to do what he can to track down Alex's location. Heading to the museum, Charlie wants Mark to steal a small terracotta statue from the triads, which just so happens to be filled with drugs. Due to the art showcase going on, certain parts of the museum are cut off, so you can't make a quick beeline to the basement where the statue is. Instead, you have to sneak upstairs, fight your way through the triad, then down into the basement to fight off even more of them and nab the statue. After escaping the triads and meeting up with Charlie and his crew, Mark has had enough and is ready to go down trying to take out the aging mobster. But we're only an hour into the game, so you can guess how that goes. Don't push me, Charlie. Don't be silly, boy. Think what could happen to your little Alex. You're in no position to play around. I ain't messing around, Charlie. <laughs> Amateur move, Mark. Always be aware of your surroundings and never leave your back exposed to the enemy. Thanks to that little outburst, Mark now has a chaperone for his next job. Shit gets worse for Mark as Liam calls up afterwards as he fills him in that the triad wants him dead too and that he still hasn't found Alex. Charlie wants us to head to the courthouse to ambush a prison van transporting his nephew Jake, and then to bust him out. It's a timed mission, as you'll have to race to find the van and then damage it enough by smashing into it and running it off the road. Once the van's taken out, Eyebrows will take care of the cops who were on board, and we're introduced to Jake Jolson. We'll stage his death using a body that was apparently in the car this whole time, and after Jake unloads on some cop responding to the scene, Mark will drive back to the warehouse from earlier. As the psycho reunites with his buddies and joins in on the fun of torturing some poor sap upstairs, Mark takes the opportunity to snoop around and see if he can find his son. Unfortunately, after getting past all the guards, Alex is nowhere to be found. And while he can't pinpoint his exact whereabouts, Mark does see that Charlie marked off some important locations on a map, so he calls up Liam and asks him to investigate those spots. Oi, Ammon! What are you doing? Oi, boys, in here! I thought I told you to stay put. You think I'm doing moron? I'm looking for my kid. What do you call me? A Mormon. The fuck's that? You know a Mormon? In Bible bashes, come around knocking on your door. Telling you Jesus is a fucking yank. Despite catching Mark snipping around, Jake and the boys don't give him much shit and instead put him to work on their next scheme. They want him to head to Chinatown and drop off the body of the guy they just killed to piss off the triads. Instead of trying to outrun them, Mark will have to lead the triad back to some empty lot so Jake and the boys can ambush and massacre them. Unfortunately though, it's a setup, as the lot you lead them to belongs to the Yardies causing a huge firefight to break out between both groups with Mark stuck in the middle. This level is absolutely brutal, as you're fighting somewhere around 50 enemies split between the Triads and the Yardies, and you have to kill all of them before you can leave. Right off the bat, you have a few Triads shooting at you once you get out of your car, and even if you do kill them before confronting the Yardies, more Triad will spawn once the Yardies spot you. Next, you're completely exposed once you walk through that walkway, so if you're not at full health, Get ready to get shot to pieces by the Yardies before you even see them. And finally, some of these fuckers have Molotov cocktails, which will instantly kill you if they connect. Get ready to hear this sound a lot. You'll need to move fast and find good cover before either group can kill you. Before even walking through the doorway, it's best to take out the triads that followed you. This will give you some breathing room to heal up and ambush the lone Yardie at the doorway and grab his AK. Once you're inside, a bunch of triads will spawn behind you. That's when you want to make a sharp turn to the right, dodge rolling till you're behind a huge container, killing anyone there and using it for protection. Once in position, the Yardies and triads will mostly focus on killing each other, 
with only a few stragglers coming after you. After one side is dead, most likely the triads, you can start picking off the remaining yardies and finally get the hell out of there. It's going to take several tries, as despite the strategy I just gave, you could still easily get killed before finding cover as some yardies are using shotguns and can drop you fast. On top of the molotovs that I mentioned before, you can try blocking the entrance to the doorway to prevent the triads from coming in, but for the life of me I could not park this car properly to where I could block the path and get out. After surviving, Mark is understandably pissed when one of Charlie's goons, Harry, calls up to see how he's doing. Charlie, not quite, it's Harry. Charlie wanted me to relay a message. Fuck Charlie's message. That mental case Jake almost got me killed. Sent me into a war zone between the Yardies and the Triads. What's his game? It's fucking bodies all over the place. Fucking Jake. Boost the motor and get out of there. Charlie's got something for you. He needs this one, son. He needs it bad. Do this one for him and he'll owe you. He'll definitely give you your boy back. Charlie's got one last job for Mark. He wants him to get into the police station and kill the chief of the flying squad, McCormick. He's a crooked cop who's on Charlie's payroll, but has apparently been working with the other gangs behind Charlie's back, so he wants him dead. And while you're at it, he needs Mark to kill Yasmin, the lone woman who participated in the botched job to kidnap his wife and son. McCormick has brought her in for questioning, and Charlie's worried she'll expose the truth about what happened. This is another rough mission mainly because of how many things you need to do and just how long it is. First, you have to drive halfway across London and get into a fake phone repair van you need for the job. Then you have to drive around, find the real repair van, and disable it before it can make it to the police station. Mind you, this is all happening while both the cops and Yardies are still chasing and shooting at you. At the police station, after you're left alone, you need to sneak into the off-limits area and make it to the evidence room to grab a gun. Kinda irresponsible of the police to leave a loaded gun just lying around, but okay then. From there, you need to find McCormick and slowly stalk him, making sure he and no other cops spot you until you're alone with him in the interview room and you can kill him. It's a slog to get through this section, and it's ridiculously easy to fail due to all the cops patrolling through the building. But once you give McCormick an early retirement, Mark will confront Yasmin, who will cut him a deal in exchange for her life. And who the fuck are you? I was there when Charlie's boys topped your wife. Supposed to be a simple case of nabbing the kid. Ah, but they killed her. Thanks for making it easy for me, eh? I know where your kid is. I can even get to him. I know the layout, the security, all of it. I'll help you, Hannah, if you help me. Growing desperate, and with the whole police force about to descend on him, Mark takes Yasmin's offer to help get her out in exchange for her rescuing her son from Charlie's place. Despite having some assistance, it's still not easy to get out of here, as the confusing layout of the police station can have you running in circles. That's on top of all the cops you'll be fighting off, with several of them rocking machine guns. If you make it to the back of the station, you need to shoot the electric box through the automatic gate to prevent it from closing but I can guarantee you won't pull it off, as it will start to close before you get outside and you need to use manual aim to hit the damn thing, in which case you'll need to leave out the front door instead, fighting through even more cops. If you do manage to make your getaway, Mark will call up Harry to let him know the job is done. Unsurprisingly, Charlie isn't done using him yet, and now he wants Mark to head to a strip club owned by his old gang, find a stripper named Layla, and bring her back to Charlie's loft. While Mark is rightfully frustrated that he's being forced to butt heads with the Collins gang again, Yasmin instead sees this as an opportunity, as they could use Layla as a way to get into Charlie's place and find Alex. Call me crazy, I don't think it's going to go as smoothly as she expects it to. My hunch is proved correct as after shooting our way through the strip club, Layla ends up getting killed in the crossfire. Welp, that's it. Pack it up, folks. Mark is screwed and his son is done for. Just get our boots off. All right then, maybe this could work. After stealing the dead girl's clothes, Yasmin manages to convince Charlie she's Layla over the phone. So he needs Mark to drop her off ASAP. Oh, and of course, he's got another job for him too. 
This time he needs to hit up the Yardie's drug lab and rip them off for the cash they have stashed. Charlie yet again manipulates Mark, telling him they'll split the money and he can use his half to get out of London and disappear with Alex. Admittedly, that's probably the only thing that Mark can do now, as even if he could prove his innocence in his wife's death, he still left a trail of bodies all across London, including dozens of cops. So it would only be a short reunion with his son before he goes to jail for life, or gets the death sentence. After dropping off Yasmin at Charlie's, Mark will fight through the Yardie's drug lab and hits the jackpot when he finds a stash of 300k. Calling up Liam, Mark decides he's going to keep the whole thing and double cross Charlie, hiding the cash in a car and telling Liam where to pick it up. Alrighty, once Yasmin gets the job done and saves Alex, it'll be happily ever after for these guys. Heading to the agreed meeting spot at the depot, we get into a shootout with Jake and the boys when they realize Mark double-crossed them before they could do it to him. Despite fending them off and fighting through the depot, Mark's luck runs out as he's ambushed and knocked out. Oh, you've been a bad boy. You betrayed my trust, Mark. There's one thing I can't stand. It's a man who don't keep his word. In the right, Yasmin. Didn't quite manage it, did you, darling? I think you were losing your touch or uh, got your mind on other things, maybe. Get on with it, Jolson. You've always been a drama queen. Why don't you just clipped us? Waking up in a cell beside Yasmin, it looks like she wasn't able to get to Alex. Gee, it's almost like Charlie instantly recognized she wasn't his regular girl, Layla. Now at his mercy, the old bastard reveals his master plan and why he had Mark hitting up all the other gangs. Obsessed with being in total control of London, and frustrated the other gangs were whittling away at his empire, he came up with a scheme to get rid of the competition. First, forcibly recruiting Mark to attack their businesses, shifting the other group's attention solely on him. Next, to call up the heads of those groups, and offer Mark up on a silver platter as a peace offering between them. Then, get them all to agree to meet up in one place where they can make the exchange, and finally take them all out by blowing them up with a bomb. I doubt that was his original plan, as several times throughout the story he didn't really expect Mark to survive. So kudos to the old bastard for coming up with this idea on the fly. Charlie and Jake will take their leave and head to the meeting spot, leaving some guards behind to watch Mark and Yasmin so they can bring them later. The pair give up and await their fate, Yasmin offering Mark some comfort by letting him know she did see Alex and that he was still alive and okay. Just as all hope seems lost, they get some unexpected help. Oh, you're breaking my heart. Are you two just going to sit there feeling sorry for yourselves, or do you want to stop that little Hitler? Oh, not you. You're that copper from the prison van bust. It's Frank Carter, your other playable character. While we were busy doing Charlie's bidding, Frank was working to try and expose the crimes he's been committing, his work eventually leading him to the building where Mark and Yasmin are being kept. Despite some hostility and Yasmin insisting they can't trust the cop, Mark takes up Frank's offer and working together to take down Charlie. After the trio fight their way out of the warehouse, Mark and Yasmin will first head to Charlie's loft to try to find Alex. And holy shit, fuck this level. Charlie has some laser grid system set up in his house that requires you to find ways around paths being blocked. If any piece of Mark's hitbox touches the lasers, and this includes his guns by the way, so be careful when you're aiming, the security will go off and gas Mark to death. It's frustrating as all hell to navigate these lasers, as some will require you to hug the wall to slide past, or dodge roll underneath them. But the real problems are the ones that are laid out in such a way, you only have a few steps you can take to avoid touching them. However, because of Mark's sensitive walking controls, and the lack of camera control, it is infuriatingly easy to run into a laser when you're trying to position yourself the right way. Oh, and this isn't a stealth mission either as you have to deal with Charlie's guards during this whole mess. You know what, I take back what I said earlier about Yasmin getting caught so fast. Cause goddamn, how is anyone supposed to get through this bullshit house? And as it turns out, it was all a waste of time. As once we're done searching the place, Frank will call up and fill us in that Charlie has already moved Alex to the ship where he's planning the gang meeting. Heading down to the harbor where the ship is docked, Mark and Yasmin will have to fight through an army of Charlie's goons all over the boat ending in a final confrontation between Mark and Harry. Well, it's supposed to be a confrontation, but you wouldn't really know that as there isn't a cutscene of the two squaring off, 
and outside of some missable dialogue as you fight through the ship, you'd have no idea you were even shooting at Harry in the first place. Once he's dead, Mark will finally be reunited with Alex, finding him down in the hole tied to a bomb. Yasmin and Frank will show up after, having killed Eyebrows and Jake Jolson respectively. All the gangs will then show up, with Liam holding Charlie at gunpoint as the leaders of the gang decide on what to do with Mark. Mark pleads his case to his old boss Nick, how his wife was murdered, his son was kidnapped, and he was forced to work for Charlie. Despite their misgivings, the gangs come to an unsteady peace agreement, allowing Mark to leave with Alex and Yasmin. However, they demand that Frank be left to die alongside Charlie, as none of the groups trust a cop to keep his mouth shut. While Mark tries to argue for Frank's safety, the cop just tells him to get the hell out of there. As the trio safely get off the ship, the bomb on board seemingly goes off, consuming the boat in flames as the fate of everyone on board is left in the air. Now it's time to stop and rewind the story, this time to see it from Frank's perspective and learn how he got here. Sorry if this part feels a bit more abbreviated compared to Mark's story, but not as much happens when playing as Frank. Anyway, so I pulled her over and went, hold on a minute, this looks interesting. That's the brow. So what's the brow doing at one of their bargain basement brothels, eh? Let's move. We'll have him. Hold on, Frank. Whenever the brow is about, his psycho boss isn't hard to find. Take a look at this. It begins with Frank in his car with his partner Joe, the pair on a sting operation outside a rundown brothel. While they're waiting, they hit pay dirt when eyebrows and then Jake Jolson make an appearance. The cops calling in for some backup to assist in arresting them. Frank gets impatient and insists they rush in instead of waiting. The pair are fighting their way through the rundown building, with Joe taking a bullet to the gut courtesy of Jake. Frank will arrest the bastard after catching up to him, handing him over to his fellow officers while he drives his partner to the hospital before he bleeds out. Back at the station, Charlie is already working to get Frank out of the picture, calling up McCormick to stop the detective from interrogating Jake. Instead having McCormick do it himself, and feeding him info about a drug delivery the Yardies are waiting for. Listening in on the interrogation, Frank takes the bait and heads down to the docks, clearing out the Yardies and arresting one of their top guys. Afterwards, he'll receive a call for assistance over the police radio, which takes him down to the Republic, just after Mark had set the place on fire. There are gang members rioting and shooting each other outside the place, so Frank will have to stop the violence the only way a cop knows how. Started blasting. Bang! Wow. Bang! Bang! Try to shoot him in the back. Unfortunately, a police officer's work is never done, as Frank will now have to head over to Chinatown and stop the shootouts between the Triads and the Arties. After fighting his way through a parking garage and restoring the peace, his boss chews him out for going all cowboy cop around London. This is not the A team, Sonny. What's your problem, Mac? I've just managed to pull off more collars in half an hour than Operation Bloody Trident has in two years. Who do you think you are, Rambo? This is London, not fucking Hollywood. Hey, if you have a better way of stopping heavily armed criminals hellbent on killing you, I want to hear it, boss. Otherwise, get the hell out of my way. Frank can't spare any more time for McCormick, though, as he finds out the prison van transporting Jake Jolson is currently under attack. Like in Mark's campaign, he arrives too late. Instead, almost getting killed when Jake opens fire on him and causes his car to flip over and crash. Unfortunately, his troubles are far from over once he returns to the police station. Your history, Carter. That's it. I've had it up to here with your lunatic antics. What the hell do you think you were doing? I was trying... Don't answer that. I'm not finished. Off the case and suspended from the force, Frank decides to dig deeper and find out what the Jolsons are really up to. He first starts by heading to the Yardie's drug den to find and save his fellow officers who were led into a trap by McCormick. Heading back to the police station to confront his boss, he instead decides to tail him and see where he's going, eventually being led to the warehouse controlled by the Jolsons. This is that frustrating stealth mission I was talking about, as you have to follow McCormick as he walks around and talks to these guys, but it's easy to get spotted and the bastard won't move unless you're in the right spot to activate his dialogue. Frank will discover his boss's corruption, but before he can bust them, he'll overhear McCormick giving out his partner Joe's location. Turns out Joe has dug up some incriminating evidence on Charlie, so he wants him eliminated. Racing to the hospital to protect his buddy, he'll check in on Joe first before fighting and killing all his would-be assassins. Joe fills us in on where we can find evidence of Charlie's involvement in busting out his nephew. 
along with some other criminal deeds he's been up to. Heading to the depot where this info is located, we kill the guys guarding the place and find the incriminating files on Charlie, along with a list of the operations he owns. Frank decides to hit up each of those buildings, his first stop conveniently being the same warehouse where Mark and Yasmin are being held in the basement. After busting them out, Frank will head back to the depot where he followed McCormick around and discover that Charlie has Alex with him. Calling up Mark and Yasmin to fill them in, he makes his way to the ship where the big gang meeting is taking place. Like Mark, Frank will have to fight his way through the ship, killing everyone in his path, leading up to a final confrontation with Jake Jolson. And just like the fight with Harry before, it's not really a final confrontation, as outside of him taking way more bullets to kill and running all over the ship, you may not even realize it's Jake you're hunting down. After crazy Jake Jolson hits the ground, it skips ahead to the ending cutscene after Mark and Yasmin leave with Alex. And I'll let it play out, cause it's glorious. It starts right now. Somebody shoot a fucker, he's gonna die! What do you mean? Don't do that! If the finger go. comes up the button, it blows us all! Scarboy on the hammers! Now! Two world wars, one world cup! Get the fuck! I really wish the game ended here, but unfortunately we got one more level of bullshit to get through. With Charlie setting the bomb to blow, Frank only has 3 minutes to escape the ship before he's blown to bits. Unfortunately, despite the looming threat of imminent death, for some stupid reason, all the gangs have started fighting each other instead of trying to escape. Also, just like the other time missions, you don't have a visible timer to let you know how much time you have left. Three minutes is barely enough time to escape, as different parts of the ship will collapse blocking your path, all the while you get slowed down by enemies trying to kill you. And because it takes forever to recover your health, you can't afford to take too much damage. So you'll have to drop enemies fast or just straight up roll past some encounters so you're not slowed down. But once you get to the surface of the ship, you're home free. Wait, that's it? Kind of an abrupt ending, no? That leaves so many questions unanswered. Did Frank Carter survive plunging into the water after jumping from the exploding ship? Were Mark, Alex, and Yasmin able to leave London together to start new lives? Are any of these questions answered in the sequel? I don't know. I'll be honest, I didn't even know this game had a sequel until years after it was released. And I still haven't played Black Monday to this day. I usually don't mind an ambiguous ending, Especially if it makes me stop to think about how things may or may not have turned out. But this feels less like the devs wrote an ambiguous ending, and more like they didn't know how to wrap up the story. With Charlie Jolson and everyone wrapped up in his scheme dead, Mark has no way to prove his innocence in his wife's death outside of his son's and Yasmin's testimony regarding the event. Though, like I brought up earlier, even if that was enough to clear him, he'd still go down for all the mayhem and death he caused while working for Charlie. Hopefully Liam didn't die on the ship so he can get the money he stashed to start a new life. Frank, I'd say, is probably alive. It'd be a serious punch in the gut going through the hell of escaping the ship only for him to drown. And with the evidence he found, along with Charlie blowing up, he got what he wanted in taking down his gang. I don't know, maybe everything is explained in the next game. Week ending aside, what did I think about the getaway? Well, while overall I have a positive opinion of it, it's not without its flaws. I like the story, its characters are all well voice acted, and its original music score really suits its gang setting. While I've never been to London myself, I can appreciate all the work they put into recreating the real deal. I just wish I had more to do in it. I think Frank's half of the story is a bit weak. I don't know, I wasn't as invested in it as I was in Mark's story. It just didn't feel as personal. Just your usual cowboy cop needs to expose an internal corruption plot. The gameplay is where I'm the most mixed as there were a lot of frustrating moments throughout. 
I think the shooting and driving are fine and work well enough in the absence of a hub. It's the stealth that really gets me. It's just too janky. The movement controls and lack of camera control make it way more frustrating than it needs to be. And some of the stealth sections go on for a while. So it's even more frustrating when you make a mistake and have to do the whole thing all over again. Time sections were a pain in the ass too. As outside that final level with Frank, you have no clue how much time you actually have to get to an objective. I know having a countdown timer on the screen breaks the immersion the devs were going for, but I don't know, maybe you can have it in the pause screen or have your character audibly say how much time is left. I'll be honest, the getaway, while definitely novel for its time, has definitely aged over the last 20 years. Better and more fleshed out takes on the formula have been the standard now, so it can really feel archaic. As unlikely as it is, I would love to see this game get a remaster or just a full-blown remake. If they updated the game with modern graphics, fixed the movement and camera controls, and added actual iron sights when manual aiming, and kept everything else the same, it would be perfect. I don't think a full-blown remake would work, but I think it would end up aping GTA too much. It might end up losing what makes this game feel unique in the first place. At most, all I can think of is maybe giving us some bigger levels, a longer game, fleshing out Frank's story better, and giving us an actual ending. To sum up my thoughts, The Getaway was a fun and unique experience to return to after all these years, but with the genre evolving so much in the last 20 years, it's a hard game to recommend to someone who's never played it before, and who might be expecting something way closer to GTA. Though if you're willing to put up with some jank and can be patient with its more frustrating levels, I think you'll walk away from it satisfied. And that's the video. Thanks for watching guys. After my miserable experience playing through Bulletproof, it was good to replay a game I actually liked, even if I forgot how hard it actually was. Not much to talk about this time around, but for those curious, the next video will be on GTA Chinatown Wars, so get excited for that when it drops in a week or two. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and comment down below. Did you play The Getaway as a kid? Did you ever manage to beat it? Is the sequel Black Monday or the spin-off Gangs of London any good? Let me know. I might take a look at them somewhere down the line. If you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. I don't do much on there other than posting figures or new games I buy, but I'll link my Instagram down below if you want to follow me there. Oh, and I don't chill it enough, but if you're a G Fuel enthusiast, you can use my link and code below to save off your next order from their site. Don't forget to check out the recommended video and playlist here at the end. You might find more of my content that you'll like. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.